Well, hello, students. It's Rob Daywalt, your instructor. I'm following up in uh, session three with my comments. I'm sorry I didn't get these up here sooner, but it's been kind of a hectic week. Um, as you may know already, you should know already, our discussion this week is about specialty courts. And there, a lot of you have done a really good job on this. Um, probably the easiest uh, court to remember would be the um, juvenile court. There are other specialty courts that have been mentioned by some. Uh, a lot of them are talking about drug court, which is a, a good point. Um, but there's another court that has been brought up by a few in last week's session, and that is tax court. And the thing about tax court is, even in um, state level, uh, there are tax questions and tax problems that come up and every state has a Department of Revenue, I'm sure, or they wouldn't be able to operate. Uh, and so people get into it with the Department of Revenue for that state. And so it's always an option to take that case to the tax court. The problem, I know in Indiana, for a lot of people with the tax court is it's in Indianapolis. So if you're clear up by Chicago or clear down by Evansville, it's quite a long uh, trek to get to Annapolis to file a case or attend court or anything like that. So that can be a little bit of a difficulty with some of these specialty courts. You don't find them everywhere. Uh, another one I want to talk about just briefly is the bankruptcy court. The reason I want to talk about it is that is a federal court. There is no right to bankruptcy in state court. So you need to keep that in mind. The other part is that the alternative to bankruptcy that states do use is a receivership. And the thing about a receivership is a lot of times uh, those are just filed in a general court like a circuit court. But a receivership is not generally as favorable as a bankruptcy uh, because uh, people can come in in a receivership and file claims against your property uh, on the state level and there are just not as many protections as there are in bankruptcy court. So there's usually no voluntary receiverships filed in court uh, in the state. Sometimes they can be involuntary but they are short-lived usually because by the time the person goes and talks to a lawyer uh, they will have filed bankruptcy because they will uh, be able to get um, money that they are entitled to through the bankruptcy more easily than you can in state court. The other part of it is that they rank uh, claims in bankruptcy court so that an unsecured claim is usually not going to get any money uh, in most cases. Uh, now there are some exceptions to that like where if you owe somebody wages is a good example, child support another good example. Uh, you can't get out from under those but um, just like if you have some credit card bills that are unsecured, those are gone in bankruptcy. So keep in mind that that is only a federal right. There is no state bankruptcy court. Uh, and there are actually uh, some lawyers, uh, it's a growing field of lawyers that just specialize in doing bankruptcies. Uh, so that's something to consider too. Not just everybody uh, does bankruptcies on a you know, a day to day basis. And there are changes in the bankruptcy law, it's almost continual. So that's one area that you need to frequently, you know, like update yourself. So, uh, moving on uh, to other issues in the learning module, I want to talk to you a little bit about it. Um, I want you to remember the reading uh, for the module, and I'm trying to get to it because I tried to click it and I click four on the accident. Okay, so uh, you're looking at Chapter 4 in Module 3, so you want to be sure to look at that, uh, talking about case or controversy. Uh, a lot of times people might come up with like a hypothetical question, but it's not something that really affects them. It might be part of their philosophy or something, and they want to file a lawsuit just to um, ease their mind or something about whether you can do a certain thing or not. Problem with that is, uh, constitutionally and, and in all the states, uh, it's a uh, common uh, perception that 
you have to have an actual case. Somebody owes you money or somebody broke into your house or uh, someone hit you with their car. Um, so there has to be an actual case or controversy. So what that means is that you have to be arguing with something that's real. Like a lot of times I used to see uh, boundary line uh, controversies. And that's what we mean when we say a controversy. You know, where should this boundary line be? And you had two different surveyors out there, and somewhere along the line, one of them screwed up. So sometimes a judge will just hire a third surveyor, have them go out, make the parties split the cost of the third surveyor, and whichever one that the surveyor agrees with, <clears throat> that's the party that's going to win. So there's uh, some things uh, like that that you need to keep in mind. Uh, looking at your readings, uh, talks about the federal court, uh, and again, uh, talks about um, uh, California courts, uh, and then there's a thing up here on the Bar Association uh, and a Missouri Juvenile Court Handbook, which I think is very useful if you guys that are wanting to be like juvenile probation officers um, might want to take a look at that. It may not be exactly the same in your state, but I would suspect it's going to be pretty close. Uh, one thing I would say about that, I know when I was a probation officer, uh, basically I had a badge. That's all I had. Uh, it was really more like an ID card. Uh, whereas um, now today, I mean, you see a lot of probation officers carrying guns. Uh, you see them wearing coats with probation on the back of their coat. Uh, you actually wear them see, you see them wearing a metal badge. Uh, so more and more probation officers are acting and dressing like police officers. One of my issues with that, I used to call them uh, police wannabes, police wannabes, because uh, they got a degree, they can make more money in probation, so they accept the job, but really what they always wanted to be was a policeman. Uh, so I call them police wannabes because they want to wear a, wear a gun. Uh, but I don't know. It could be argued that in some places at least that when you have to go into the neighborhoods, which I did, uh, sometimes you do have to um, be awful careful about your safety. Um, so uh, once again, uh, keep an extra eye open for your final project milestone one uh, and uh, it's talking about a draft of judicial systems. You want to look at your milestone one guidelines under your lesson which is uh, module three as I said right at the bottom. Uh, so we're talking about jurisdiction and venue. I think I touched on venue pretty well last time. Uh, if you um, didn't get that, um, I would say look at that Roy Lee Ward case that I have out of Indiana. Uh, it's an awful terrible murder case, but it basically uh, shows that even somebody that's apparently, you know, literally caught red-handed because the guy had blood on his body and on his hands when he walked out after uh, raping and murdering this young girl. Uh, and the deputies were standing on the porch and he walked right out into their arms, literally. Uh, so there's not much of a defense there, but the guy was entitled to a change of venue. So uh, I think what he was trying to argue more than anything was a mental health issue. So, you know, what I'm saying is that venue can be changed sometimes. It is necessary, and it's just one of those things that you have to go through. Uh, in order to um, follow the due process standard that we have in this country. So um, I am going to send out that Roy Lee Ward um, site. I'll put that um, up in a discussion here, and uh, you might want to look at it, but I am warning you that it's uh, not G-rated. It's pretty much X-rated. So um, Hope you guys are uh, enjoying catching on here and, and really uh, learning something. If you any time you have any questions or problems, feel free to get a hold of me. And you know my email is right in there just like yours. Mine is pdaywalt at snhu dot edu. So let's start with an email and then if we do need to make a phone call, uh, we'll, we'll trade phone numbers and we'll get a hold of each other. Uh, thanks a lot for all your attention. Uh, like I say, hope things go well. Have, have a wonderful weekend. 
But remember, we've always got work to do on the weekend. So good luck to you and thanks.